Three centuries after their creation, the famous violins of Antonia Stradivari are in great demand and sell for as much as fine works of art. The most renowned musicians dream of playing a Stradivarius. These violins have become veritable legends, so much so that today we can no longer tell what they are really worth. Has their quality been proven beyond a doubt, or are they overestimated? Are these instruments really so precious? Is their sound really unique? Today, acousticians, chemists, violin makers, and musicians are trying to answer these questions. In laboratories, workshops, concert halls, they are trying to understand just what makes this mythical instrument unique and to pierce its mystery. Lot 48, at one million dollars, one million dollars. A Stradivarius used to be simply a musical instrument. In the 1980s, they became investments. Today, only banks and very wealthy collectors can afford to own one. And the prices are skyrocketing. One million, one hundred thousand, one million, two hundred thousand. One million two hundred thousand dollars. Sold. How much is a Stradivarius worth? Well, I wouldn't use the term bottom of the line, but let's say they run between one million three and one million five hundred thousand euros. And the renowned Stradivarius violins cost about twice that, around. 2 million five, 2 million six hundred thousand euros. Lastly, you have a very small selection of instruments that belong to the star soloists. The violins of Menuhin and Oistrak. And you could say that violins like those are priceless. Out of the 1,000 violins that Antonio Stradivari made, there are 500 still in circulation. This Stradivarius dates from 1704. Like so many others, it has a special story. It had been forgotten in an attic and was rediscovered by a family in the early 20th century. From there it was sent to London, where an expert authenticated it and christened it the Sleeping Beauty. At present, it belongs to the El Bank Baden of Württemberg, who bought it for Isabel Faust. I discovered this violin thanks to a friend who saw it on sale in Munich. He told me, you should go see it. It's the ideal violin for you. I played it for 10 minutes, and those few notes just bowled me over. There were notes, excuse me if it sounds a bit kitsch, but there were notes like I had never heard before. For a musician, the artistic value of these instruments is huge. I don't know a single violinist who's not convinced that a Stradivarius is pure happiness. Like Isabel Faust, the greatest violinists consider that the Stradivarius violins have an exceptional quality. They praise the rich sound, their clarity, and their force. In this chorus of praise, it is sometimes difficult to tell whether the qualities of this violin have an objective, measurable basis.
In Germany, violin maker and physicist Martin Schleske has developed a certain number of computer tools capable of measuring the physical characteristics of a musical instrument. When a musician entrusts me with a violin that has a very good sound, or when people tell me, what a wonderful timbre, it's a very precious Stradivarius, and I think the same thing, I wonder why? Where does this timbre come from? And thanks to this analysis, I can say that yes, it resonates in a particular way. For each violin, Martin Schleske measured the resonance of the body at 600 different points. Then, using a graphic analysis program, he created a visual model of the oscillations that shows the deformations of the top and bottom plates of the violin, that is to say, the upper and lower parts. You can see very clearly which parts of the body vibrate with a large amplitude and which with a small, where you have oscillations in the same direction, where they are in the opposite direction, and how the top and bottom plate work together. That's the mechanism that produces the sound. This analysis shows, it's really quite surprising, that each violin has its own personality. I've analyzed three excellent Stradivarius violins from the violin maker's golden age. A characteristic of a Stradivarius is that the energy is concentrated in the central zone, and that's what gives such a round, harmonious sound. With Garneri, on the other hand, the energy is all in the upper part and the lower part. It's very warm in the low notes, very brilliant and aggressive in the high notes. With the Stradivarius, all the energy is situated harmoniously in the middle. Scientists may have succeeded in showing that the Stradivarius resonates differently than other violins, but they still don't know exactly why. The violin, a complex object made up of more than 80 pieces, doesn't give away its secrets easily. For two centuries, people have been wondering about the uniqueness of these instruments. They have measured, weighed, and observed them from all angles, in vain. Is it now possible for us to pierce the mystery of the Stradivarius? Where will we find the answers to questions that musicians and violin makers have been asking for so many years? Should we go to Cremona, to the town where Stradivari lived and where it all started? Should we believe those who say that Stradivari was inspired by the forms of the pediment of the cathedral where he designed the F-holes of his violins? Or should we enter the Palazzo Comunale and visit the Sala dei Violini, where one of the finest Stradivarius, the Cremonese, is on display? Or perhaps we need to go to the town museum and examine the only painting featuring the craftsman to seek out a clue that will point us in the right direction. The painting in the Museum of Cremona shows the work in progress, the research of the craftsman who throughout his life never ceased to experiment and innovate, adding and subtracting a few millimeters to the dimensions of the instruments. Stradivarius is there, in the center of the painting, holding a flask of varnish in his right hand as if he were wondering. For many, his secret is there in those few milliliters of the precious protective mixture. The town where Antonio Stradivari lived, more than 300 years ago, has not forgotten its past. There are still 150 violin makers following in the footsteps of their illustrious predecessor. Varnish is the thing that fascinates violin makers. They go wild over it. They say that Stradivari used an oil-based varnish. They've tried to duplicate it, but it's not easy. The main colorants are sandarac, matter root, pigments, different types of yellow, among which curcuma and cambogia. 
Of course, it's very difficult to find out exactly what Stradivari used to make his varnish. They've analyzed it, but of course, we haven't come up with his recipe. The Music Museum in Paris has five Stradivarius violins. Stefan Weidelich, the head of the museum's laboratory, has given us permission to film the fluoroscope examination of the Davidov, a Stradivarius named after the famous general to whom it once belonged. With this examination, one can determine the chemical elements that compose the surface of the violin and thus its varnish. Here we can see the elements of calcium and potassium, which are in fact the wood that appears underneath. Then we can see iron, the zinc, probably copper, and then more specifically, here in this area, we can see lead. And this lead is present just about everywhere on the surface we've examined. The examination has revealed the presence of metallic elements over the whole surface of the top plate. Could this be the explanation? Could the presence of copper and zinc possibly explain why a Stradivarius sounds better or worse than other violins? I'm not about to venture an answer to that question. What's more, the examination of the Davidoff under ultraviolet light revealed other surprises. Certain zones of the instrument are no longer protected by the original varnish. The eight or ten layers of Antonio Stradivari's varnish are either quite worn or even completely gone from certain zones of the instruments. Most of the violins are either in this condition or have been recently re-varnished, so we can't establish any cause and effect between the fine layer that covers the instruments and their tone quality. The first X-ray analyses of the Stradivarius violins were eagerly awaited. Unfortunately, the examination that revealed the architecture of the instruments also brought to light the transformation that they had undergone down through the centuries. Indeed, most of these violins have been modified to meet the musical demands of the period. Their neck, the chords, and some of their main pieces had been replaced. Often, the only piece of the Stradivarius original work remaining is the body itself. Other scientists have suggested that the acoustic quality of the Stradivarius comes from the characteristics of the wood that the violin maker selected. Some claim that the wood should be cut at the full moon. So, along with the serious theories, we also get the most far-fetched. Between folklore, science and poetry, the mystery deepens. During his long life, Stradivari tested different types of wood. He made many forms. He experimented with a lot of different materials. The trees of the Alpine Arch and the Tervisiano region are all very good quality. We think they're certainly of a quality comparable to those used by Stradivari. Today's violin makers, like Stradivari, use spruce and maple to make the top and bottom plates of the violin. Taking a preliminary core sample allows one to see how the tree has grown and if it's suitable for a musical instrument. Observing the growth rings of the tree gives an idea of the mechanical qualities of the wood. The slopes exposed to the north are the most favorable for growing these trees. We've seen through experience that the trees more exposed to the sun are floored by blisters of resin and internal blemishes. 
e un'altra cosa è la litologia del terreno. Another important criterion for selecting trees is the quality of the soil. You have to look for arid terrain with not much water because on these terrains the trees grow much more slowly and so the fiber is much more compact. The ring structure is much tighter. According to American scientists, the climate in the 17th and 18th centuries is perhaps responsible for the inadvertent success of the violin maker. At the time, Europe went through a minor ice age. Trees used by Stradivari would have been subjected to long periods of winter cold. So, the growth rings would develop very tightly, resulting in a very dense wood with unmatched sound quality. Even if this argument carries a certain weight, it goes only so far, for the other craftsmen of the time work with the same wood, from the same trees, but without the same success. Another theory seems more plausible, according to which the quality of the Stradivarius violins is a result of the drying time of the wood. The defenders of this explanation think that the violin maker worked only with very dry wood. It's even thought that he bought a stock of wood from his former master when he retired. Scientists have tried to put this theory to the test. Dendrochronology allows us to date the trees used by instrument makers. This science is based on the study of growth rings whose width varies from one year to the next according to climatic conditions. The measurements taken from the top plates of each violin are compared to reference curves to give us not only the date each tree was cut down but also which stand of trees it came from. But how can we find out how long the wood dried? 50, 60, 70 years, like some people claim? It's Antonio Stradivari himself who provides us with the answer, for he would always glue a label inside the body of his violins with the date the instrument had been made. Taking the difference between the age of the tree and this date, scientists can figure out how long the wood dried. As far as the drying time of Stradivarius violins go, well, the studies carried out recently in England and Germany tend to give a shorter drying time than what we always thought. So not 60 or 70 years, but rather 20 years or even less. The theories that have been advanced about long-term drying techniques should clearly be revised. The violin maker's art is to be found elsewhere. The quality of the wood, the drying, the composition of the varnish, the climate, none of these explain the value of a Stradivarius. Should we investigate the history of violin making and imagine that perhaps Antonio Stratovari was the last guardian of a secret skill that has since disappeared? La chance de Stradivarius. Stradivarius was very lucky to have as his master Andrea Amati, 
who was a real perfectionist. And when you see the pieces that he turned out, they're already instruments of great finesse, great mastery. So when Stradivarius started working on his own, he designed a violin that was maybe a bit more stocky, a bit more virile, with shorter corners, a bit more robust, with a thicker head, but still was a very fine-looking instrument with a lot of finesse. And so he showed the way to modern violin making. The secret is an assiduous activity at the beginning. You have to be totally immersed. You can't hold back. I used to have an uncle who was a painter. When I was very young, he told me that to make a good painter, you have to sleep in your studio when you start out. Soak up the smell of turpentine. Get your hands dirty with paint. Have it under your skin all day long. You have to relish the feel of your fingers in the wood shavings. You should be polishing your hand with the wood as much as the wood with your hand. You know, Stradivarius was just this chunky fellow who spoke with a thick peasant accent because Cremona was a bit like the Berry region in France, just as rustic, and they have a heavy accent too. So if you just picture this stout man with his rustic accent, that shoots holes in the idea of mystery. There's no mystery, there's mastery. It's much more beautiful. For violin makers, the quality of Stradivari's violins was born from his insatiable curiosity, from the scope of his research, from his rare mastery of the workmanship. According to them, the subtle harmony of his instruments is a result of his excellent craftsmanship rather than a secret formula. And yet we can still wonder. Because for three centuries now, violin makers have been trying to attain the quality of Stradivarius without ever, according to musicians, succeeding. Perhaps there's some detail that they've overlooked. It's always very amusing to discuss that with colleagues. Recently I was talking with a very good violin maker, and it was so typical. He said to me, you know the way the layers are spread over the plates doesn't affect the sound, because on a Stradivarius it's not at all even. In one spot it's thinner, another it's thicker. And I answered, on the contrary, the application is very important. It's precisely because it's asymmetric that it sounds so good. We often think, like him, that perfection is the right path, whereas this perfection is disastrous for the sound. According to Martin Schleske, these differences in the thickness of the layers would explain the richness of the Stradivarius sonority. And yet, even though all violin makers agree on the elegance of the master's violins, some voice doubts about their supreme tone quality. They even dare whisper in their back shops that they are not really exceptional instruments. Should we believe them? Is it possible to verify the tone quality of the Stradivarius objectively? In Paris, the Musical Acoustics Laboratory of the Pierre and Marie Curie University carried out a blind test for us. Two soloists, David Grimal and Raphael Oleg, played a Stradivarius and three other violins hidden behind a screen. Two music critics, Jacques Fustier, a violin maker whose violin was played in the test, and two other violinists, 
listen to them and try to evaluate the sound of the instruments and identify the Stradivarius. There's one violin that really stands out clearly for me, that is to say, it reacts instantly. The sound is dense, robust, over the whole range, a violin that truly speaks. I observed that apart from very small differences, all the violins were very good. For me, the one that stood out was violin number three, but there were two violins that were somewhat closed. I thought I recognized one as a... Uh, but I'm not sure. I felt it was the violin that touched me more on an emotional level. So I put it down as the Stradivarius. In fact, we're proceeding from a somewhat faulty premise because we start with the assumption that the Stradivarius is better than the other three. Would you like to know which one was which? Yes. The one you all liked was the Fustier. It's pretty amazing that we were all taken in like that. The questionnaires filled out by the participants in the test were analyzed by a psycholinguist from the Pierre and Marie Curie University. This researcher studied the vocabulary used and has attempted to highlight the unconscious link that connects the musical perception and emotion. They noted down how they were affected by the sound. And we could almost say the very idea of an ideal instrument that will move them in an absolutely unheard of fashion, they didn't find it. They were somewhat critical with regard to almost all the instruments. They found that one lacked brilliance, the other lacked force, another lacked feeling. In the end, the sound never really delivers to them all the emotion that they were hoping for from the magic ideal violin, which for them would be the Stradivarius. If you take three or four people and you tell them you're going to hear a Stradivarius, they're going to be in a very exceptional listening situation. They're going to muster all their capacities because they know it's an extraordinary instrument. They're convinced that it's amazing, superior to anything they've ever heard before. They're in an extremely receptive state with regards to this instrument. And that can explain why several participants in the test were disappointed by not having picked out the Stradivarius. Because they were expecting to be completely swept away or captivated by one violin over the three others, which was the case but it wasn't the one they were expecting. This blind test is not the first test to cast doubt upon the superiority of the Stradivarius violins. Does this mean that today's violin makers are capable of holding their own against their prestigious predecessor? and that perhaps Stradivari did not invent the definitive form of the violin. I sometimes feel that all the violin makers are climbing this mountain where King Stradivari is stretching out his arms in a gesture of blessing, and he's saying, I'm the father of all violin makers. And they're all trying to reach his level, and they say, look, I've managed to touch his foot. No, I didn't make it to the top, but almost. 
As far as I'm concerned, for a certain time now, I've been doing a lot of thinking and research, and I've been getting promising results. I have five patents for a new type of violin, but I still need a few years to perfect this new type of instrument. I have to come down from that mountain with Stradivari on top and look for another mountain in this vast landscape. Maybe there are others that are even higher. And it's very exciting to think that you can make other mountains heard, other tones, other possibilities. Certain violin makers have already started to climb the other mountains that Martin Schleski speaks of. In Belgium, Gauthier Loup, artist, acoustician, and violin maker, refuses to believe that the violin has to have a classical form to sound good. So he's experimenting with the form of the violin, with the idea of expanding its palette of sounds. It's true that when you listen to a Stradivarius, you hear a perfect sound, a beautiful sound. So why change? Is it possible to do better? Will we end up doing worse? We have to take action first in order to get an answer and then free ourselves from the cultural shackles that is classical violin making, the reigning conservatism. Gauthier Loup's ideal of tone quality means throwing into question the golden numbers of the violin, but his classical training at the violin making school of Cremona has held him back for a long time. He found that he couldn't blaze new paths on his own, so he decided to work in collaboration with a contemporary painter. Violin makers are very into the technique. Even if they try to break out of the mold, the Baroque form comes back automatically. So maybe it is a little easier for a painter who works with color and form without any constraints of any sort to come up with a form that is more free. These paintings here, you look at them and you say, no, where do you see a violin in there? And when the violin is finished, the painting is everywhere in the violin. So they're not blueprints, they're not diagrams, but they are true. I discovered something rather simple, that there's an asymmetry in a violin. Because for the high notes, there's the sound post, and for the low notes, there's a bass bar, which is a kind of spring. So the vibratory mode is very different, and to fulfill this need, I designed a new form of violin with one half of the body smaller for the high notes, and the other half of the body larger for the low notes. And by putting the two together, I succeeded in expanding the palette of tone colors and enriching the harmonics as well. And you can really sense this equilibrium between the form and the function of the instrument. I think he's really getting close to what I'm looking for. For example, the beginning of Beethoven's Seventh. Right from the start, you can feel that it's very mellow, but very precise. That is to say, the attack is very clean. And in the low notes, you can hear... It's all there. Photo. 
In the 18th and 19th centuries, violin makers also refused to simply turn out duplicates of older instruments. The violin making school of Cremona has kept the results of their research in its storerooms. A cubist violin, a violin without F holes, with lateral F holes, with F holes in the form of a G clef, a trapezoidal violin. These experiments all pose the same question. Is it possible to establish a relationship between the sonority and the form of the instrument? That brings us back to what you asked me. If one can hear the shape of the violin in the sound. Let me try to put the question in scientific terms. That would be like saying, if you play a skin-covered drum, can you hear if the drum is round or some different shape? It took ten years to solve this problem scientifically. And the answer is no. You cannot, by analyzing the sound, that is to say, interpreting its qualities subjectively, reconstruct the origin and shape of the instrument. The violin is obviously a much more complex instrument than a drum. But according to the acousticians of the Cremona school, it's not possible to identify a violin by the sound it produces. The same sound can be emitted by two instruments of different shapes. Given this conclusion, the very idea of an ideal shape makes no sense. So how can one explain the unshakable reputation of a Stradivarius violin? Should we look into the life history of these instruments that were once owned by European princes and the most renowned soloists? Try to find which one of these histories gave birth to the legend. Perhaps take a look at the history of the Messiah, a violin bought by a French violin maker, Jean-Baptiste Villaume, from Tarisio, an Italian dealer. Villaume relates that every year, Tarisio would promise him an extraordinary violin with a quality so magnificent that no one had ever heard anything like it before. This violin, this Stradivarius, he would bring it next year. So when Tarisio died, Villaume rushed to Milan and got there two days after his death. He went into Teresio's little room, which was over an inn. And in this very poor room, Teresio lived very simply, he found several violins, one of which was an extraordinary, untouched instrument with an amazingly pure varnish. And that was the Messiah that he had been waiting for so long. He brought it back to his home and placed it in a display case in his workshop. There he held visits and would relate the story of the violin. So I think that Vuillaume was one of the persons who created the legend and he told and retold this story and embellished it as much as he could, all the while making identical copies that were absolutely magnificent, worn varnish, identical, but that looked used. So the old violin became the one you just had to have. Down through the centuries, the anecdotes and stories accumulate and the legend grows. Pierre Amoyal's violin once belonged to the Tsar of Russia. During the 1917 revolution, Paul Kochansky, the violinist of Stravinsky, took it with him when he and Arthur Rubinstein, the famous pianist, fled the country. When the two men were arrested by the revolutionaries, Paul Kochansky had the idea of playing the Internationale for their captors. So, Thanks to the Stradivarius, they were set free. But there's more to the history of this violin. Its legend grew with another episode. The person who was after the violin was watching and jumped into my car. I saw the car taking off with my violin. And I felt like my life had been turned upside down and my body turned to water. 
s'échappait tout, tout It was pure horror. Pierre Amoyal went for months without any news of his companion. But his Stradivarius brought bad luck to the thief. The man was found dead a few months later with a bullet in his head. The musician then hired a private detective and thus began a treasure hunt between Turin, Genoa and Milan. Four years later, after long drawn-out negotiations with the Mafia, Pierre Amoyal finally recovered his violin. When it was stolen, I realized that I loved it even more than I thought, because despite all the wonderful violins I'd played, that's the one I missed. Yes, I'd have had to say that it's something like being in love, and each one gives as much to the other. Because you know that a Stradivarius violin that's played badly or mistreated loses its tone quality after a few months. Often when violin makers see my violin land on their workbench, they tell me, you two are happy with each other and it shows. But it can be heard in the sound as well. I always ask him if it went well for him, what he thought of the concert that we had just performed together. And what did he answer? Well, he's happy, it went well. I've played so many concerts with this violin, we've had extremely moving moments together, overwhelming emotions. Wood is a living material and the genius of Stradivarius, who impregnated this wood with his life, his craftsmanship, his soul, all that means that this violin listens. It doesn't merely play. It listens and it lets me know that it has heard many things. Science may be able to investigate the sound qualities of an instrument, but it cannot grasp the relationship between a violin and the musician. Perhaps that's where the mystery lies, in the secret complicity that binds the two protagonists of a piece of music. In the sounds that are created through the work of rehearsal and that are offered to the public at the time of performance. In this learning and mutual exchange process, such that certain specialists claim that the sounds are not produced by the violin, but by the violinist him or herself. It's difficult for the general public to discern these subtle but very important differences. For me, it's vital to work with an instrument like this one, to seek out new tonalities, to develop new musical ideas. This is what gives an interpretation such life.
Zweig ist, die Ausgeglichenheit. Und das ist, äh, What counts in a violin is the overall harmony, and it's surely one of the strong points of a Stradivarius. Even if the personality of the violin also counts, that it's different for each Stradivarius, and that you can like it or not. That's how it is with violins. You might like or dislike certain instruments, and there's not necessarily one violin that would be the best in the world. It has to correspond to the person, almost like a lifelong partner. It's like the perfect man. It doesn't exist. But in fact, no. God forbid, I wouldn't compare it with a lover. But it is the extension of one's soul. And for a violinist, it's vital to find the voice that will bring it to life, the sounds that you've been carrying inside of you for so many years. For a musician, a Stradivarius is an incomparable companion. Unfortunately, now that they are so coveted and sought after as investments, they've become objects of speculation. Bought by banks, they are often stored in the vault or, in the best of cases, lent to young violinists for better or, sometimes, for worse. There's this thing of being able to say, my instrument, there's something about that. It's true, I just spent a month with this violin, and I say to myself, this is my violin, it's part of me. And sometimes I think, and if it were over tomorrow? It's very emotional. It's crazy. And it's true that the sword of Damocles is hanging there. When you don't own it, there are days when I have like a panic attack, I think. I play and I'm so happy, and I think, but it's gone. I make the most of the moment, they're going to take it back tomorrow. <laughs> That's even worse, because when they take it back, it's to lend it to someone else. It's humiliating. I have a violinist friend. They lent him a Stradivarius. It was from a private collection. And then they took the instrument back because after three or four years, the collector decided that it was time to lend it to another violinist. And it's true that for a young musician, it's really hard because he had to go back to his old training violin, which are not necessarily bad instruments, but are nowhere near a Stradivarius. He really suffered. I've seen this type of thing often enough to know that it's a frightening risk. It's like taking away a part of you. I think that we'd be very happy if they weren't so expensive, because they've become simply unaffordable for most of us. They're practically collector's items, and it's really tragic because a string instrument dies if it's not played. I haven't experienced that, but I've heard that in Germany and France they hang violins by the neck like cadavers, that they store them in display cases for long periods of time, and when they take them out they've lost their life because the wood has become ossified. Only a few museums in the world take the trouble to keep their Stradivarius violins in working order. In Cremona, the director of the Palazzo Comunale opens the display cases every day and plays each of these exceptional violins for a few minutes. He says it's just to get the wood vibrating and so that the instruments have a certain life so that the Stradivarius violins don't sink into a slumber and gradually forget what brought them glory and built their legend. <laughs> 